So, hey guys, welcome back to this episode of Sounds Like NYC. Today, our guest is Dean Gordon, a young, a, a young, a young luthier, guitar luthier based in New York City. He has a background in graphic design, but now makes boutique guitars of his own original design. He, uh, he has apprenticed under a few talented NYC-based guitar makers, such as Roger Sadowski, Victor Baker, and Craig Peterson. And he's also the head luthier at Chelsea Guitars, NYC. So welcome, Dean. Hey, what's going on? Nothing much, nothing much. How was your, uh, how was your Thanksgiving? Yeah, it was, uh, it was probably the quietest Thanksgiving and that you know I've had in my, in my life. But I, I would also have to say that, uh, well, I don't have to say, it was the first Thanksgiving we had in this house and we've been living in here since 2003. Uh, and because we would usually either go to my uncle's or a family friend's Christmas is usually done here. So that was a weird one. It was like, wow, Thanksgiving here. I've been living here for so long and I've never, never had that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, because like my family has like, is like all based in like New York city and Jamaica. And obviously we're not going to Jamaica to like celebrate Thanksgiving. So, so like, I've never had the opportunity to like go anywhere outside of my own house during Thanksgiving. So like, right. I don't understand the hype. I don't understand why so many people decided to like do that over this weekend, but uh, I guess it's whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, we, we normally do that, but everyone kind of, as it got closer to Turkey day, we were kind of just sitting there and saying to ourselves, you know, we don't know, you know, what's going on. So-and-so is working here and then so-and-so is going all over the place and no one wanted to risk it. So we just stayed home. It was me, my parents, my girlfriend. It was, it was relatively quiet. Her family's upstate and they were like, look, don't even bother. So, <laughs> open the door. Yeah, you know, we didn't, yeah, we didn't even do turkey. We didn't even do turkey. I actually just like roasted, slow roasted a, our pork uh, loin in like a Dutch oven and I, I cooked it with like apples, onions, and apple yeah, cider that's for like, way for like than turkey. Yeah. it's yeah. And I cooked it for like seven hours. That's, that's <laughs> way better than turkey. We, and, we did uh, we did like pernil, but like in the uh, like a was it like a fucking pressure cooker? And we were just afraid it was gonna blow up because we've never used a pressure cooker. <laughs> so yeah. obviously we have to experiment on, on Thanksgiving because you know why not? Why not? Yeah. 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 Well, consider a Dutch oven. The Dutch oven is just one of those like ceramic pots you put on your stove top mm. and you put it on low or simmer on your little stove and you just let it cook for hours it's it's really easy real straightforward always comes out good no matter how good or crappy of a cook you might be yeah nice, there nice. You go. That helps and, it, and it is better than turkey in my opinion <laughs> i love turkey but you know no nah, i can't, I can't stand own, turkey yeah. right you get one day to eat turkey one day no, I mean, <laughs> that's if you choose to because turkey is probably like super cheap the rest of the year it's just that for this like one week of oh, you know no yeah, i might like, I might get turkey on like a sandwich from like a sandwich joint. That's what I'm saying. Well, that's not the same thing. Yeah, but it's not like a rote, like a nice turkey. But like, I still, I don't know. I eat it. I don't hate it. I just, if I could, pre I prefer my my slow cooked pork yeah. loin. <laughs> yeah, All right. So, so meat meat debates aside. Meat debates right? aside. Thanksgiving how, debates how, how aside. How long have you been Sorry. building guitars? <laughs> <laughs> sure, you don't want to talk about food. No, uh, I've been making guitars for you know man, how long is it now? I'm 26. I started when I was 16. So it's 10 years now. It's about, it's a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I was kind of tinkering with guitars on and off maybe before I was 16, but like, I don't really consider taking it as seriously until about then, you know, and then a little later I, on, I got my apprenticeships, which, you know, were now a long time ago. And, you know, that, that's when I began saying to myself, like, wow, this is something that I really dig. I really appreciate this. I don't know. I mean, craft you know it's a it was beautiful to me the wood the tools everything it was i've always loved that kind of a thing i was never like super good at math or science so i wasn't going to be an engineer or anything like that i wasn't going to be a doctor you know uh <laughs> I, I you know now so i i kind of went along with it through my apprenticeships i realized like hey i you know i have my my thing here like i i obviously picked this stuff up pretty pretty well uh and eventually you know i came up with my own designs uh which are i attribute a lot of my success to my super unique designs you know if i just came out of here and i was making a traditional like fender style copy which i now do today now that i have a, a name and a reputation actually uh but when i was younger i was really against this naively stupidly i don't know how you want to call it i was against doing something uh 
that was like the traditional thing again like a gibson copy or a fender copy Mm -hmm. everyone did it and i just thought it wasn't the cool thing to do uh i kind of have a little bit of that in my head now even though i'm doing them it's kind of like i always see guitar builders a lot of guys get very snooty a lot of you know guys get uppity about it it's a very pretentious business and you know it's like man you make a copy you know you're not like come on make something that of your own design and oh, I have my own design and the guy will show me like a Fender copy that's just been changed a little bit, Right. you know? And it's like, come on, man, like make your own design, you know? And that's the art of it. And that's, I guess maybe my artistic background, going to, going to college that and kind of coming up, going to, want, going to art school was part what attributed to it. But I figured if I could make it, I'd want to make it up with my own design. I want people to see the shape and they don't need to see the logo. They could see the shape and they think my name, yeah. right. you know? Uh, now today I make the uh, traditional Fender copies like a Telecaster or Jazzmaster, and the reason I do that though is uh, because it, you don't make a lot of money in this business, and I kind of felt that I had to expand, and I thought it would be smart to kind of do these guitars with my own taste and my own flavor and my quality. Mm-hmm. That way, you know, if somebody goes, "Hey, you know, I'll buy that guitar. It's not as expensive as Dean's original designs, but it is a Dean Gordon." And they get it and it might promote the idea of, wow, this guitar is great. You know what? Maybe I'll give that nice, that original design a shot and I'll ante mm-hmm. up to it. Uh, and that's kind of the idea. It's, you know, again, it's that and it's the business idea too, is that I'm selling more guitars now that I offer that, that range because my guitar is not for everybody. I always acknowledge that, uh, you know, my designs. But that traditional design and aspect is uh, something now that is a, a big source of income for me. And Again, when I was younger, I hated it. I hated the idea of making a copy. But today, now I look at it as my bread and butter. This is what pays for me to do what I love to do, which is my own stuff. Right. I mean, I think it's sort of like, you know, when uh, artists, like musicians, they make, you know, like covers versus like originals, right? Maybe you just need that one cover that you execute well to sort of bring people back to your original stuff. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And that's like a, yeah, because, um, because you know, I've seen you post about this in the past stuff on Facebook and kind of like, and we've like talked in the past about kind of like, kind of like your like frustration about, you know, how like the whole, I guess, industry is like, you know, guitarists are like notorious for, you know, not wanting change and like being yes. like very like slow to like mm-hmm. accept innovation and like, and like, and like new ideas. Yeah. And, like, this business like, is, still stuck in 1960 no, for no, the long, for a large part yeah, you know no, it's like it just doesn't move it's it's slow as it's slow as it's just it's yeah, just so yeah, slow man yeah. slower than the, yeah. it's, i can't it, even explain it give it like 20 more years all the boomers will be dead and then <laughs> <laughs> innovation can finally i don't know no because because it's because it's great because because you know even like you know because um okay so like let's let's talk about your is it is it your two kind of like kind of like original designs like let's talk about them specifically like how did you go about developing them kind of like rejecting traditionality accepting modernism and like what was the, right. what was the process what was the design process what was what was the thought process behind so, developing those two guitars because they're like really out there you know right so when i was 16 is when again i had my apprenticeships and you know, that's what, like ninth, 10th grade. Uh, was it 16? I'm not even remembering anymore, man. It was around then. It was high school. And basically, you know, in being involved in those apprenticeships was always got my kind of like my creative juices flowing in the sense of I was always sketching up little designs on paper. So I'd be sitting in class, not paying any attention because whatever they were teaching me was worthless. And <laughs> I'm not paying attention and I'm just sketching up designs and you know, I found that I kept initially as much as I didn't want to make a traditional design for like Fender style, Gibson style, I found that I kept drawing those designs up. And I was like, all right, this is stupid. You know what I mean? Like I kept saying, I kept scrapping the ideas. Like that looks like a Telecaster. Oh, there's a guy that makes these get this design and, or I'll come up with the design and I'll be on Facebook and I'll be on some guitar page and someone will post it. Oh, check out this Johnson guitar. And I'll be like, Oh, and it's like exactly almost what I drew the other day that I thought was so <laughs> cool and different. And I'm like, you know, and it, through that process, I actually learned how many stupidly, how many people are out there making guitars and sucking up all the air in the room. 
Uh, <laughs> and is uh, we'll get to that later. That's another thing. Uh, but um, you know, so I said, you know, I really got to think radically. So I started with that kind of wacky, that aluminum, that that squiggle design, the aluminum piece that I have on the bottom of my guitar here. I could show you one right here. Yeah, that makes sense. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have like a few pictures over yeah. there as well. So, like, on this guitar, I have this aluminum piece mm -hmm. here. And I kind of started with that in mind, saying, all right, let's do Radical. Now, there was one guy that did something similar to this at the time, and it was uh, Uli Teufel, yeah. uh, Teufel Guitars. And he kind of has his, his little piece, I don't know if it's aluminum or not, is maybe it's like less than half the length of mine. It was a little inspiration, though, for me to say, you know, that's a cool thought that's so different and radical and there's so few people that do it that I bet if I worked my own design around that, you know, I'm not going to have the problem of coming across someone who does something like that. And sure enough, I came up with the first design, which was the Miris design, uh, which is my more like tele telecaster style, you know, Les Paul style. And then maybe a year or two later, I came up with this design, which is called the Virtus, uh, which is my more popular model these days. Um, you know, but that's how I landed. You know, it's just, I was actually drawing it up in, at a, uh, in a 10th grade, I think it was 10th or 11th grade English class. I'll never forget teacher Ms. Zaphos was always screaming at me because here I am. And she's in, we're in art school. This is the high school of art and design. So everyone was always just drawing in the middle of class. The teachers hated us for it. Like, but what can they say? Even though they decided to work like at a school for like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what's a... You're bored, all you have is a pencil and paper. What are you going to do? So everyone's, mm -hmm. dude, you looked around those classes when the teacher turns to the chalkboard and everyone's drawing <laughs> random shit. And I wasn't the best illustrator, but, you know, I could draw my designs or at least brainstorm. So that's, that's kind of what I did. And I landed on those, that kind of metal aluminum piece that I have and that design. And it, it stuck. I really, as soon as I drew out the mirror shape and I kind of refined it and I saw it and I maybe, and I laid it out in Photoshop a little bit, I was like, man, this is cool. This is something. And this could work. Uh, and then I eventually, uh, I believe it was actually my senior year high school, that summer, maybe late, maybe just after senior year, I made the first one. And it looked so damn cool. And I, and I said to myself, man, I like, the, in, man, the first one, I have it in the closet over here in pieces. I can't even look at it anymore because it's just horrible compared to what I make today. <laughs> but the point is, is that got that idea in my head that if I could refine this, it's something. And it's something that I've heard so many people say to me that is harder than, you know, it's for good artists, for a great artist, I guess, success is critique. You know, like for me, like if, if a lot of people hate it, just as many people hate it as like it, you know, that's a great thing because it invokes thoughts in people's heads. Now in the beginning of my career, I hated when people would shit talk my designs because you know, there's things people would say to me were so like full of hate and as ridiculous. And, you know, a lot of my friends will call me a hater and I am a hater. <laughs> um, that's no doubt about that. I'm always very honest about myself, but when it comes to guitar design, I'm always like, man, these people are stuck in the past. Like mm -hmm. everyone's like, I'd see Fender releases a new guitar and everyone on the comments is like, Oh my God. Or some company that's been making the same damn guitar for 30 years, 40 years. Now people are freaking out. And I'm like, man, they did this already decades ago. Like what is so cool about that? Can you imagine if Lamborghini came out the same car for 40 years? No, they would have got a business. Like the old, this is the only business on earth or at least one of the only businesses on earth that has not really moved on from its core designs. And I've had a lot of people tell me like, Hey, you know, these designs are, you know, they, they work all the legends played them. So why change it? Which is yeah, true. It's a it's really not broken. Don't fix it. Right? It, it. Exactly. And it's a great argument. And I don't really have much of an answer for it, but the answer that I have is, you know, every other business has moved on, you know, cars, for instance, you know, a car in 1950 does just, yeah, sure. Today they have AC heated seats and everything, but they do just about the same damn thing as every car today, which is go from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. Some today do it faster. Some today do it quieter, but it is the same thing. This guitar plays the same way in, in large part to a guitar from 1950. Mm -hmm. 
but the difference is it's a little more lightweight. It's a little more ergonomic. It mm-hmm. feels a little better. It sits on your lap better. When you're standing, it's fl- it, it hangs better. You know, it's that five ten percent difference that applies. And so that's kind of where I landed on my designs. Is I, I had that mindset of man, we, there's got to be some change here. And if I'm going to succeed, if I'm going to get ahead, I got to have something different. There's a lot of guys that have been doing this for 20 years, and all they make is a, a copy, and they don't really get anywhere. And it's because they make a copy. It's 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 because they don't branch out. Hmm. I mean, for for you, like when you're making a design, like how much do you think about like you know, like ergonomics or like, oh, I guess what's the most important aspect for you when you're designing? Like, well, for me, when I do a design, I, I'd have to say that the first thing I actually start off with is looks. I mean, I hate to say this, especially if guitar players listen to this, but like, man, from what I gather, worked, I've worked in guitar stores. I've, I've got friends who sell hundreds of guitars a year. This shit is all about looks. I'm telling you, these people are all about looks. Man, Sound I mean, is- Guitars are naturally vain, you know? Like, yeah, I mean, but in general. For, in general, for most, let's be honest. For most people, though, oh, they they care so much about sound. No, you don't, man. <laughs> no, you don't. I see the guitars. I've looked heavily into this and the, like you know social media, and I've really, really looked at this heavily. I mean, it's my job, mm-hmm. and I noticed that like I could post a picture of the most ergonomic, best playing guitar on earth, but it could look like nothing special, and it won't get anywhere. But the second someone posts a picture of some guitar with insanely figured, beautiful wood and crazy color and, oh, my God, that's amazing. And I find that all these luthiers that come up out of nowhere today, it's like the one thing they all have in common is just like really, really fancy wood. Mm -hmm. I mean, my case study for myself is if I put up a guitar of some solid color, like this one metallic or the green one that I just finished up, which are beautiful guitars. They get a lot of positive reaction, but then I'll put one up like, like with insanely like purple. Yeah. Like something with the, like the, yeah. Yeah. Something with either an extremely wacky finish or something with gorgeous, beautiful wood, this insanely figured all over the guitar, just ridiculous. That gets way more reaction than this solid color stuff. Even if this might be the best guitar I've ever made. Mm-hmm. And of course, how can people tell it through a photo? But I, I've gathered that, you know, when you walk into a guitar store, guitarists don't go, man, I bet that thing sounds great. And they pick it up. Very few guitarists do that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the guys that go, man, that looks great. Key point looks great. If it doesn't grab your eye, who the hell is going to pick it up? So mm-hmm. it's, that's a huge thing. I mean, my guitars might feel and play better to a lot of people, but a lot of people who don't like the design would never play one because of the way it looks. That guitar ain't for me. What do you mean it's not for you? It's a guitar. It's got six strings, six tuners, a bridge, pickups. It does exactly what your Les Paul does. Mm-hmm. It's not for you. Why is it not for you? Because you don't like the way it looks. Right. That's why. And it's, yeah, same thing for cars, clothing. I mean, you know, you can make the most comfortable piece of clothing on earth. No one would wear it if it's ugly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so I, that, that's, yeah. that's that's how I look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and it's definitely true. And like, you know, it seems like this industry is so cutthroat, like either, like, like either you get away with like making copies, which is like nothing wrong with that because people also, also, also bring their like, you know, own inter- interpretations and style into it. Right. So like, you're like either lucky enough to kind of like make more or less part casters or kind of like modified Fender designs, especially or you do something crazy like yourself or like Strandberg or like Aristides with, with this like totally innovative design or like technique or, or, or like, you know, sort of like the futuristic sort of thing. And yeah. there's no like middle ground, is, it, is there really? There's, there's very few middle ground. So it's, it's a, it, you know, the business is in like kind of like a, I don't know, you can call it a golden era. And there's a reason why. Is there's a lot of luthiers who are coming up and I notice this on Instagram, especially because I get a lot of people sending me questions, commenting on my page. So-and-so guitars liked your photo and I'm like, Oh, I'll click on it. And it's like, Oh, it's aspiring luthier. And like the guy makes what looks like a beautiful guitar. And it's like, okay. And it's like the guy has a CNC machine in his back in his garage, a cheap one. And he makes guitars. And it's like, Dude, I can't tell you because of CNC technology getting becoming so affordable. You have more wannabe luthiers than ever. Right. And they're and it, it, I hate to 
this is going to sound grumpy and this is like my old man side, <laughs> but like, I hate these people sometimes because it's like, man, then you, then all of a sudden people buy a guitar from him and it's a piece of crap because yeah. this guy, just cause you know how to CAD and work a CNC machine doesn't mean you make a good guitar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you could suck at fretwork, the fundamentals of making a good guitar, your design could suck, your the nut make everything. And guy buys it and it's like $22,000 guitar and like, bad review oh and then all of a sudden all these people i'm never buying from a small luthier ever again and it's like mm -hmm. that just hurts guys like me and mm -hmm. there's hundreds of these people you can just find mm -hmm. them all over instagram it drives me it drives me like nuts the problem with like any industry right now because like with all you know with the internet basically so everybody has you know access to to anything and it, it, it's sort of like with every industry it's just become so loud that you know people like you get sort of lost in you know all the noise Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. It's a, that's a great way to say it too. It's very loud, it's, and he even said it, uh, Daniel. It's it's cutthroat. Mm -hmm. oh, I see so many people. Oh man, like I get they hit me up. Oh, like I, I want to be a luthier, blah blah blah, and I'm like, man, if you're not gonna, if you don't, <laughs> yeah, if you if you don't don't have the ability to really grind away at it, I'm fortunate. My family really has afforded me the opportunity to do this in the beginning, you know, and it's clicking now. Like I've had. This last month was my best month yet. It's taken me 10 years to get here, though. You and know, I've sold... Quick, considering, you know, how... Yeah. Because you're so young. Like, you're not even 30 yet, and you're, like, starting to, like, break yeah, through. Yeah, So, like, yeah, so... Yeah, you know, it's... Uh, it's I, I've had a lot of people say it's quick. I guess that's my, my energy and my excitement for it is that I feel that it's been slow. Mm -hmm. I want to... I feel like I should be further, and, you know, it's not that I'm upset with my work. Like every five guitars or so, like I feel like I'm kind of hitting like a new level. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I would say it's the downside of buying it from a guy like me at this stage is like, man, like if you see one of my guitar, like if you see one of my guitars like two or three years later, it's going to be better. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> not that I haven't made great guitars or that people don't love them. Like, you know, it's just, that's just how it is. I'm improving and it's, uh, but, you know, with the noise, like you said, it, it's, it's tough. It's so cutthroat and people are always saying, Oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. And the money problem is there. Like my family has afforded it for me, like I said, and has enabled me to get through those first few years to establish myself to the point where, you know, I could start making, bringing in enough money. And still to this, to this day, there are some times where like, I have my family there for me, but that's, unfortunately the way it is for a lot of people you know you got to kind of fall back on on certain aspects and mm -hmm. i'm like semi ashamed to say that because it's kind of like you know like man like where would i be without them i might not even be able to be doing this so i'm saying this to be thankful for my family my father my mother and everyone who's helped me like <clears throat> get get this far i mean but at the same time i always tell them, aspiring people like if you don't have that network don't go buying $10,000 worth of tools and spend all your savings on this shit just to turn around and make $15,000, $20,000 a year selling try, or trying maybe to sell guitars. I mean, cause even doing 20 grand a year, that means you got to sell like after tax and everything, if you're doing everything legally and after all your expenses, you got to sell like, I don't know, like if you're selling at a decent price, 10 guitars a year, 15 guitars a year. And that's not easy. So especially at a decent price, or if you're selling them cheap as all hell, which you're not doing yourself any service by doing that, you'd have to sell a ton of them. Right. And it's like, you can't live selling three or four guitars a year like so many of these guitar builders do. So that's why a lot of guys will come up and then all of a sudden you'll see them vanish because it just becomes about money for a lot of people. And sure. you know, it's, mm -hmm. things take time. And I always tell that to people like, just cause you have that CNC machine or you have access to one and you made a couple of guitars and you, you think it's easy, <clears throat> you, you know, it's not. I had a guy at one of my, at one of my dealers, uh, I was in the shop and there's a guy, sweet guy, I'm not gonna name any names or anything, but he said something to me. You know, I came in with one of my simple Telecaster style guitars, Fender copies, and he goes, he said something along the lines of like, yeah, but making these is nothing. <laughs> and I was like, what are you trying to say to me? Like. You know, he said it like all, oh, and he was like, look at the project that I'm working on. And yeah, for a first time guitar, like it looked great. Now this is an older guy. He's obviously able to afford some tools and, right. you know, and he's worked with his hands his whole life on motorcycles or something like that. So he's really good with his hands. Uh, and he's a really nice guy. He's a smart guy. He's like a whip, but 
he said that to me and I was kind of taken aback because I've heard other people kind of say it like, no, sure, you know what? This Telecaster might just be like a cutting board. It might be real simple to make if you're a good woodworker, but they're not easy to make. They're actually the hardest guitars to make good. One, because there's so many goddamn people who make them. So your chances of fitting into that really good bracket are really small. And it's just to make it, there's so, there's a dime a dozen. So you have to know how to, what to make, how to make it stick out. And like the way he said that to me, it was like insulting. And that's how like so many of these guys come up today, you know, like through all these luthiers pages and everything, like they're easy, man. You have a CNC machine. You've been doing this for two years. You know, you've made five guitars, like relax a little bit, you know, like it's, I was the same way when I was early on too. And I'm still young in my career. I haven't, you know, all my specific designs, I haven't made more than a hundred guitars yet. Uh, so I, had, I know guys that have made three, four or 500 guitars, a thousand guitars, you know, they're ahead. And it's still even for me. But when I was younger, I had that hot shot attitude. And it's easy to see where it comes from. But now that I've, I'm in that middle ground, like I see where it's, where older guys kind of looked at me like, all right, like you'll learn, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> you're, you'll get yours. <laughs> So like, so like speaking of kind of like learning and stuff like that. So like, did you like hone in on kind of like, on kind of like the craft through like going to like a luthier school or just through you or, or just through your different apprenticeships over the, uh, over, over time? So, uh, you know, I learned most of what I know through apprenticeships. Roger Sadowski at Sadowski Guitars really taught me the importance of like, fine like attention to details fret work nut making setup wiring uh victor baker definitely taught me the whole woodworking aspect and finishing aspect he taught me a lot about that and craig Pedersen is an art shop maker who's like a little bit of all of it and a, a lot more design than all of them because i talked more design with craig <clears throat> than victor baker or roger shadowski uh but i took all of what i learned in their shops and i kind of built myself up you know so there's a lot of information there today and even then back in 2009 10 11 there's a lot less information than there is today online about guitar building you know like back then there was maybe five youtube channels that talked about guitar building you know now there's hundreds mm -hmm. again with all these people that think they're guitar builders mm -hmm. uh and it's like just the information and the forums and the uh, talk you know, is there, there's so many opinions, there's all these specialty tools being made and sold now that weren't even just a short time ago when I started, uh, that that's kind of how I, I built myself up though, is through those apprenticeships, through watching those videos, and then through making my own guitars. You know, my first five, 10 guitars, 15 guitars, you know, were kind of limited in that, like it took me time to, to change certain aspects of my design and to see why other designs worked and why others didn't. And I learned a lot through doing repairs at Chelsea guitars in the city. And I apply a lot of what I learned, like, Hey, if these guitars keep coming in with these problems and this is what's causing that problem, I could avoid that on my guitars. Right. I can't stress how important learning repairs are to luthiers. And, and that was a big part of learning also. What, what do you think are the biggest pain points for like guitars when it comes to guitars Like you've tried to like actively work towards? I'm sorry, I, you kind of cut out. What What are like some pain points that you hear like guitarists have that you're like trying to implement in your designs to like make that not happen? I guess. Uh, one of the big ones is kind of is uh, is fret work. Uh, you know, I get a lot of guys that come in and they have like tuning issues, playability issues, and it's just a, a huge part of it is fret work, and that's real. Like some people would say, "Well, duh," like you know, that's like such an integral part of a guitar. But even for like American fenders and stuff, which, you know, that they're like, they're, they don't really crown the frets and make them nice and rounded and like they're flat topped. Like you just play on those guitars for a year and you wear some spots out, especially if you're really playing it. And next thing you know, hey man, my guitar's pinching out, it's buzzing out. And, uh, and I essentially have to uh, get it set up and they'll come to me and I'll, and I'll be looking over the guitar and I'll see that the frets are a little dead, even after a year or two, could be a relatively new guitar. And I'll give it the setup and then I give it back to the guy and he's like, man, the strings are a little, are high. And it's like, yeah, well, in order to compensate for, you know, the fact that these frets are low and the frets behind it are high and you're buzzing out on the high frets, you know, 
I have to raise your action, the, the height of the strings in order to, for the guitar to play right and clean across the board and not buzz out. And then people are always like, oh, it's a new guitar, it's this. Well, it's like, well, if Fender kind of did better fretwork in the beginning and crowned those frets right, you know, and put a little more care in it, you wouldn't have these problems. So that, that's one point. A lot of it is in the nut making. A lot of nuts from factory guitars are often a little too high. Uh, you know, off the fingerboard. So if, like, if I could bring that a little lower, the tuning stability will be better. The, the height of the strings down the fingerboard will be more even and better across the board. There's so many aspects of guitar making. I wouldn't say that there's one specific point, but I always tell people to make sure that the frets are good if they're looking at a guitar. And, and that's, that's probably the most obvious thing though, I would say. Right. But what if it's not pretty? What do you mean? The, <laughs> What oh, the guitar? One of the yeah. guitars isn't pretty. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, that believe it or not, that's the first thing that runs through most yeah. people's minds. <laughs> you know, so, again, it could have the best fretwork in the world. If it ain't good looking, nobody's gonna play it. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about kind of like you and like kind of like New York City specifically, because obviously you're from New York City and you've and you've gotten all of your training from New York City. Um, so like if you if you don't mind, give us kind of like a crash course in kind of like the history of like guitar building or like guitar luffy years, like in New York City, because there's because there's been a lot of them and there's like a new breed, including you, um, that's like that's like springing that's like springing up now. So like how much how much like history do you know about like guitar luthery in so in the city? As far as luthery, like real luthery, like violin making and all that, I know that there's a few guys here in the city like cello guys, really, you know, like stringed instrument repairmen, like for orchestral instruments. I, I call those, re yeah, I call those guys real luthiers because what the fuck, I, I make a, a metal guitar here and like, <laughs> that's not real luthier, especially, you know, electric guitars, you could be called a luthier, but I will always call an acoustic guitar maker or an arch top maker or a violin maker. Those are luthiers, why you know what I mean? Like, why do you make that like, you know, difference. That, that so much difference. more goes into making a good acoustic or an arch top. Man, the work, it's four times the work and to get the structure right and it's all acoustic, there's no pickups. You have to make the guitar good for it to sound good, for it to be good. I can't tell you how many shit plank guitars I see that are like, man, like there's just no effort into the make, but they might sound good. You know, it's like, but if you make a shit plank acoustic guitar, it's not going to sound good. It's mm -hmm. not going to play good. If you mess that neck angle up, if you mess the bridge up, if you mess the bracing up, it'll, it won't vibrate enough. It'll sound dead. It'll sound too bright. You know, structurally, it'll collapse. Like, that's real loot theory to me. Some guys, I've said this to some guys, and they think I'm ridiculous. I'm not saying that there's not a lot of aspects that are similar. Obviously, if you're making a guitar versus an acoustic guitar, you got fretwork, you got a nut, you got a bridge, tuners. Uh, but to me, there's definitely a lot more, you know, luthery and that goes into making an acoustic or an arch top. Uh, so that's why I say that. But I don't know anything about the orchestral repairmen here in New York. Uh, I'm sure there's a great deep history and a whole bunch of guys that have been around forever. I guarantee it, actually, especially mm -hmm. in New York with all the famous music halls we have here. And it's it's New York. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as guitar making, I mean, this city has a huge history. Not anymore. Uh, New York City is like anti-small business and anti-manufacturing today. So, uh, but back in the day, man, you had Gretsch guitars were in yeah. Brooklyn. And, and that's, Gretsch is huge. You had D'Angelico, D'Aquisto. Uh, and I'm specifically talking about the city. There's more, there's more guys that, that are well known that were upstate yeah. too. I'm not going to go through that though. Uh, but, you know, I would say that it really, New York City Luthery history really starts with D'Angelico and D'Aquisto and, and them kind of start getting going and the apprenticeship that they had, uh, that they had together. Uh, and, you know, eventually one of them passed away and the other one kind of had the mantle. Uh, and there's a few guys that had, apprenticed under them that kind of were made out you know like that were made out of their careers too so now that they're gone who's the next to kin you know what i mean so it's kind of worked that way you have um oh man oh john montelion who's out on long island mm -hmm. super famous 
ritzy guitar builder. If you look up his work, it is he's as an archtop maker has to be top five most famous and well known archtop makers in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen his guitars, I've never played them, so I cannot comment on playability or sound. Uh, mm-hmm. right. <laughs> yeah, they're gorgeous. They're they're dude. They're Art Deco and like super New York and cool. Oh, I think I've seen his work in the Met actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, think about that for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, think about that. Yeah, like, man. I mean, imagine being in the Met. You know what? You know, like uh, so. Just like your hero Parker guitars, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's yeah. got one in the Met also. Was he, I'll never. Was he, was he based in New York City or? I believe he was from upstate New York. Oh, okay. He might have been down here in the city at one point. I don't know enough about him. I do know that he's still in the Northeast. I think he's up around Boston now, I feel okay. like, I think. Uh, don't hold me to that. I could be very wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I believe he definitely had a lot of roots here in the city, working with, with a few people, selling guitars. Uh, but, you know, you have all those guys. And, and Roger Sadowski and a few other guys. I mean, the, I, I think it was the ESP Custom Shop. Mm-hmm. 14th Street ESP Custom Shop was here in New York. I didn't know that too. they had a custom shop. I thought they were like always, always based like, like out like California. Yeah, I, I think they, they their custom, custom shop, shop was here in New York. York. Wait, really? Uh, ESP like currently? Not currently. Oh, not currently. In, in this was past. back in like the 80s. Like, I did, I'm like t- yeah, yeah, like, that's yeah, like I'm telling you, I, I believe it was that. And you had Roger Sadowski coming up, who's one of the guys who I learned from. He started off in the 70s also and mm-hmm. came up. And as far as I know, it, Roger became well-known because in the 70s, Fender and Gibson were making absolute crap. Those are the worst Fenders and Gibsons. Mm-hmm. And, and when I say they're terrible, I mean, they, are, they were terrible new out of the factory. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and Roger made a career of doing repairs for all the New York City players and studio guys and session guitar players, uh, bassists and guitarists alike. And Roger, who is more known for his basses today for sure, uh, was taking their guitars, redoing the frets, redoing the nut, and making them play. But then after a while, Roger's kind of like, why can't I make my own guitars? You know, like, why am I changing fenders? I want to make my own. And he started making guitars back, I believe his own dis- guitars back in the 80s, uh, real early 80s, and came up that way. And, you know, you have also Pensa Sur guitars were, were here mm-hmm. in New York at one point. There was, like, a lot of guys that kind of started off in New York and moved on you know they they all left they all ended up leaving new york as times modernized as the city i guess became more expensive whatever (laughs) it is uh you know there's a lot of history and now there's a few guys that are still around you know sadowski's still here you got fodera guitars in brooklyn too is another well-known very famous for their basses uh monteleone again is out of long island uh you have carmine street guitars rick kelly Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't put him in the same bracket as Sadowski and Fodera. First of all, Sadowski and Fodera are like, they're, they're like small factories. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking that they make like 20 to 30 guitars a month, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have crews of like 10 to 15 people. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then you got smaller guys like me. Uh, there's a few guys in and around the city. None of them really stand out in terms of doing anything like, crazy the way a lot of guys from say like europe and out west in california at least in my head do uh you know in terms of design or, or anything crazy uh i don't know i don't want to say that i kind of hold the flag for that but i would say i'm probably the most unique guitar I mean, builder in the yeah, city because i know of like a few guitar makers in the city but definitely just like generally, just like in like the whole scope of thing, like like you know, I personally see you kind of like in the kind of like in the new guard on the same level of you know Strandberg and like and like and like Aristides with kind of like you know they're still guitars but they're made in such a fundamentally different way that they're in their own league and like yeah you're definitely a part of the new guard I believe at least in like my opinion but like yeah like I, like I haven't seen guitars like yours being built you know like from the city like i've always seen guitars as like as like unique as yours so far so like you're definitely yeah doing i something mean good most guitar builders here in this area are either there's a few guys like monteleone who are known in the know you know for people in the know but they are like so quiet mm-hmm. you don't see them advertising they have like a private clientele mm-hmm. 
Uh, so you have guys like that. Uh, you have guys that are really talented guitar makers, some of the best in the world, but they'll make like two or three guitars a year because they're so f- nuts. They're mm-hmm. crazy. Like, and I mean, they're just nuts, these people. Mm-hmm. And they're so, they're really artists before they are anything to do with business and they have no idea how to get themselves off the ground. And mm-hmm. Some of these guys are young. Some of these guys are, you know, in their 60s, 70s, and they're just never really going to get anywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there's there's kind of two sides to play on, you know. Like you need business oriented mind. You know, you're not going to get anywhere if you're not kind of willing to look at certain corners differently. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you can't just Speak- look at every. Yeah. Sorry. Speaking of business, like how? So what has been the process of you getting your guitar out into you know to be known, kind of like out out yeah, of the like internet? How are you marketing? Like, yeah, yeah. So like, and like, do you have any any like any like advice for you know young like young like luthiers that want to like market their guitars effectively? And yeah, just like tell us your process of like marketing and kind of like the business side of your right. business. <laughs> so it's it's uh, a ter- in terms of like getting my name out there. Most people that hit me up are just hey, I saw your guitar on Facebook. I saw your guitar on Instagram. Social media. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's big. Uh, now I've reached out to a lot of big outlets to, for advertising and pricing and uh, like, for instance, guitar world magazine, like I hit them up thinking that they would in the middle of this COVID thing, be like willing to be cool and work. I always take chances and shots and they offered me 50,000 hits on an ad for like a thousand dollars. No, I, I actually think that's horrible if you want to know the yeah. truth, yeah, yeah. because I could post one picture on my Instagram of a guitar, pictures that I want with my tags, my control, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's a targeted audience. For $18, I did a promoted ad. And it was 20 bucks I put into a promoted ad on Instagram, and it got me 36,000 hits. Mm-hmm. So this guy wants $1,000. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. though, Instagram just got me 36,000 hits for, for 20 bucks. Yeah, my yeah, own yeah. targeted audience too. Right. Exactly. So like you think all the guys that are going on guitarworld.com are buying a $3,700 custom guitar, you know, mm-hmm. first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I kind of thought that that was a shitty deal and all these big outlets do that. So for me, again, I, I don't, I've looked at big time advertising mm-hmm. and I think that that really only works if I don't know for big companies who have mm-hmm. their name out there. Like if they release a new product, I don't think it works for a guy like me. So social media, word of mouth, uh, doing repairs. Uh, and here in the city, I've gotten a few guys who have bitten on guitars from doing yeah, repairs. That's how we they... met, you know, kind of like two Yeah, exactly. Ago when you like fix my Strandberg, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, you know, you get, a, you get a lot of people who, who hit me up through social media, but I would say it's, it's really hard to get your name out there. Do I have yeah. words of advice for anybody? Not, not really. I mean, a lot of these people kind of have it covered their own social media, you know, good photos, you know, it's, it's all very easy to do today. It's just right. a matter of catching on and doing it effectively. I think part of my success again, is having something different that catches the eye. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you make something boring, no one gives a shit how good the photo yeah. is. Uh, and when, when it comes to kind of growing the business, it's tough. I see a lot of guitar builders that seem to really kick it off because they catch a wave at the right time. You know, like it's, it's a really, it's a strange thing. Uh, and that's kind of where I beat myself up. Like going back to earlier where I said, I feel like I should be further ahead is I've seen some guys come up who still, I started in, you know, like, again, I started my Dean Gordon guitars in 2012. I know guys, I started in 2016 and like, they have like 30,000 more followers than me on social media and their fucking page is just blowing up. And it's like, what the hell is that about? You know, and it's, they catch a wave. They do specific things that I guess catch on. Like I, again, my case study on my own is that the guys that seem to do guitars made of like really fancy figured woods are the ones that really have a big following. Yeah. It's because everyone's about looks. Yeah. I, I have, think, I think I have a, cool idea I'll, I'll share with you later of just like how Ooh, we can, business uh, we business can business yourself sure uh, but uh we'll keep that on the, the yeah. dl well like because like i see even if, even besides facebook and like you know instagram like you've had like a few kind of like youtube guitar 
um, pers- personalities, you know, play and like demo your guitar. So how much yeah. has, has that factored into you gaining traction? I can't say that that has factored into selling because guys don't really approach me and go, oh, hey, like I just saw that video. I want to buy one. Like it's, they help. It helps to have videos, obviously. I, I'm not going to say it doesn't. And this year I've, I've had a bunch of videos done this year and more than I have in part of saying, Hey, I got to get more content out there. And, you know, a lot of guys are, these YouTube guys are willing to work with you. You know, I'm sending them a super unique guitar. So a lot of the times they'll do it for free or for a small fee. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a no brainer, but I have to be willing to ship a guitar to someone I don't know, an expensive guitar. Mm-hmm. And I have to be willing to lay out, you know, $300 in shipping and blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of like I don't do it all the time because of that. I don't, you know, I don't have the money to just keep shipping guitars back and forth. Right. Um, you know, it's like to do a brand new, shiny, glossy guitar and send it to someone to play is like, <laughs> you know, I, God forbid something happens, you know, now I got I to gotta sell it cheaper. And is that worth mm-hmm. it for a video? I don't know. Right. Uh, it's YouTube's tough. I, again, I've, I've done videos with some big time bigger names guys with like a hundred thousand subscribers and it's like doesn't really do much you know you get the usual comments that's cool the other comment oh that's ugly you know like it's <laughs> it's i mean those uh, are just brand plays right you just have to grow your brand and just hope that something comes out of it yeah yeah exactly I, you know i don't even know what brings success you know like i just feel like there's this thing that i'm waiting to happen like that it'll click or something like that. I don't know. It's, it's impossible to say because once you try a whole bunch of stuff and you see how effective certain things are and how ineffective other things are and you begin, your whole look on the business begins to change, you begin to wonder like, what, what's going on? You know, like how, how do some guys take off and some guys don't, you know, and it, it's just, it's the business. It's a, do, it's a, do, you, do you sell kits or just like, you know, full, like, you know, finish nah, no, no, no kits. No, I, you know, it's. I've had people ask me if I'm willing to sell just a body or something like that, but mm-hmm. no. Well, how would I do that? You know, you can't hit up Lamborghini and go, "Yo, I just want to buy the chassis." <laughs> <laughs> that is true. You know, like, who's doing that? No one's doing that. Like, I'll never understand people that email me for that shit. Well, let me buy the body. No, <laughs> what the hell. <laughs> uh, you could buy the whole guitar, and then take the body off of it. <laughs> Uh, and you get a free neck. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Then you don't need to worry about making the neck. It's yeah. a whole guitar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Again, I don't know. It's a strange business. It's. Mm-hmm. I guess you just gotta I, be creative with it, just like with anything else, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, I'm young. I'm my business is still young, and I'm young, and so it's kind of like I don't have all the answers for this yet. Whether it kicks off or whether I stay kind of doing business as I am, I, I think I'll only get sell more and more as time goes slowly, but. Uh, I'm definitely in the loop for selling more guitars or I definitely have that desire to start moving along more. So Mm -hmm. I'm kind of expanding with like what I do slowly uh, features wise. I'm going to start offering certain features in 2021 and see how that works. And Mm -hmm. again, I started doing the Telecaster copies and stuff like that and with my own spin on it. And that's helped sales, you know, and it's, uh, I just got to keep adding things essentially yeah. to kind of expand the, the palette yeah. and attract different people. Yeah. Right. Like if you don't mind, what kind of features could you give us like a sneak peek or are you still trying to keep everything? In the I way? don't, I don't really have any sneak peek of it. It's yeah. kind of what I want to start offering is like multi-scale fan frets on my guitars. Oh, yeah. I might. Never, yeah. Yeah. I've never, never done, done that. that yet. I might do headless. I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, so it's little things like that, that I'm going to start offering to kind of, expands because i've had a lot of guys say like hey man if this guitar was multi-scale i would buy it hey man if this guitar was headless i would buy it okay so if i offer headless and that brings me in an extra three sales a year mm-hmm. that's three more sales a year and then mm-hmm. if i offer multi-scale and that brings me in an extra six sales a year mm-hmm. now i'm up to almost 10 more sales a year on top mm-hmm. of maybe hopefully what i already do mm-hmm. and that's how you expand business and then there's the great question which is at what point maybe do I want to have a, like production done and maybe do something overseas or, right. or, and have production done. Now this costs a lot of money to do that. It's not cheap. It's hard to do right. 
uh, and manage, which is, you know, obviously going over the seas, making sure it is done right by that factory, whoever is producing your bodies. Uh, what do I want to assemble it here? Do I want to have them assemble it? What parts, what quality, what finishes? And then you got to buy, usually it's like a minimum of 50, you know, how, how am I going to sell 50 of my guitars? Even if they're, even if they're $1,400 each, you know, like, corner, like, Hey, I got this guitar. Hey, for I got guitars. Yeah. <laughs> like where the hell am I sticking 50 guitars? You know, how do I even start that? And then just to prototype and do all that is 10, $15,000, maybe more. Mm-hmm. And then to have it all made, think about it. You got to buy all the materials, pay for the factory, pay for the setup for 50 guitars. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're laying out between third, you know, 40 and $70,000, mm-hmm. maybe, mm-hmm. you know, and the idea is the first run, maybe won't make all you'll, you'll maybe break even and now it's all set up. So now you can do a second run. That's really mm-hmm. maybe you'll make the money. So it's like, that's a tough thing. So it's like, do I want to maybe do something like that someday? Oh yeah. You know, that might be a no brainer. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm there yet. My, I wanted to do the NAMM show this year, which is the big guitar show mm-hmm. out in California, just to kind of introduce myself as the boutique builder to a whole bunch of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe magazines will do things on me, kind of get my name out there. Now I've heard a lot of horror stories about NAMM from a lot of little guys. Cause just for me to do the NAMM show, for my own booth, not splitting a booth with some other company who maybe makes parts or pickups or maybe even another guitar builder. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's going to cost me like 10 grand, you know, eight to $10,000 just to do that shop. So think about it. That's a big risk. If I go out there eight to $10,000 and if I don't sell five guitars, I'm um, losing money. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) those guitars will sell. Then there's the other way of looking at it. Oh, you can't look at it as all money loss. If you sell two guitars, you don't break even, but you get all the notoriety and, you know, the experience. That's another thing. So, but I do want to do this show. Unfortunately, I'm in the middle of discussing it with one of the representatives over there and then COVID. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that fucked everything up. So it ain't happening this year. I don't know if it'll happen next year. (laughs) It's terrible. It sucks. Yeah. Timing is absolute crap for that. Yeah, so. I mean, hopefully things get better next year, but I mean, who knows, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, knock on wood. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Knock on wood is right. It, again, it's like I was talking with the guys, talking with a whole bunch of people. Like, hey, maybe we'll split the a booth. Blah blah blah. I had some people on board with that, and, and uh, it just fell by the wayside. Next next year, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty twenty two. But is yeah. there like anything that you want to end off with? Kind of like any last um, words or tips of advice or just shout outs or like, you know, anything that you want to end this uh, episode off with? I can't even think of anything. We hit, uh, we hit on a lot of points there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Do you want to talk about, I don't know, just no. like, <laughs> yeah, you, anything you, at you all. You can send up however you want to, to yeah. promote yourself, whatever it is. It's, yeah, I mean, I guess if you're interested, you can follow my uh, Instagram or Facebook page, which is at Dean Gordon Guitars. Uh, you know, give me a follow there. I post pictures of making guitars in the process. Uh, it's mostly the complete photos of the guitars these days, but it's still a fun page to follow if you appreciate guitars. Um, guitars. And uh, for the holidays, uh, consider supporting small businesses. 100%. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Thanks thank so you guys. On. Yeah, thank you, Dean, and thank you everybody for watching this episode of Sounds Like NYC.